started on the outreach phase for this. So I'm going to give uh, about a 10 minute overview of the project and where we are right now. Um, and then I'd be glad to take any questions. Although if you have questions as I'm going through this, uh, please feel free to jump in um, at any time. Um, so I'm going to start with the basics. Um, so this is uh, basically plan for transit oriented development. Um, now transit oriented development is is not new in Tucson. Um, you can see an example um, of that in the photo on the right side, the MSA Annex. Um, this is uh, of course built around two streetcar stops or stations, um, and there's a nice mix of, of retail, entertainment. Uh, there's some senior housing, affordable housing, market rate housing. So it's um, really a pretty nice example of transit oriented development right here in Tucson. Um, but you can see the official definition, um, tra transit oriented development or TOD uh, is a mix of commercial, residential, office and entertainment centered around or located near a transit station. Dense, walkable, mixed use development near transit attracts people and adds to vibrant connected communities. Um, now what really makes this project um, unique is the, the equity component. So the E in ETOD um, and equitable TOD uh, as we're defining it here um, incorporates affordability and accessibility into all aspects of traditional TOD. So all people regardless of income, race, age or ability have access to jobs, basic services and amenities. Um, and you can see a map of the, the planned corridor here um, on the right hand side. So you know, I mentioned the connection all the way down to the airport, but you can see some of the specific roadways uh, that we currently have in mind, um, but I'll be clear here. So this is um, this alignment is not set in stone. Uh, there are some potential tweaks that will happen um, to this trans alignment. Um, particularly on the north side, we're not really sure Oracle or Stone, and so we're going to be um, collecting data and, and outreach uh, over the next several months. Uh, I'll talk about that more in a bit, uh, but back to the equity component. This is um, really kind of a central part of this project. I think all of us uh, you know, have realized over the last couple of years, especially um, with housing prices going through the roof, just how important it is um, to focus in on, on building more housing and affordable housing. Um, and the idea here is to build more of it um, in, within close access and, and, and walkable access to a transit line. Um, so you get the kind of the win-win benefit. Um, uh, for for both the transit line and, and the transit users, as well as just the, you know, the convenience um, and just creating a more sustainable future uh, for Tucson. So if you're wondering why we chose the, the North-South corridor here as kind of the priority for transit um, or high capacity transit expansion, um, there have been a lot of studies over the past almost 20 years that have gone into identifying this corridor. Um, you can see the Mercado District plan, um, which is you know really kind of bearing fruit now, was actually started or the plan was finished in 2004. So um, that effort has been going on for quite some time. Um, but a number of both transit and land use planning projects and plans and transit system plans um, have really got into this and identified this route as a priority. Um, including the Move Tucson project, um, which is um, still, uh, I think, officially ongoing, although it may have wrapped up at this point. Big picture goals for the project. Um, you know, this is something that we're going to be going out and you know, really asking communities about, you know, what is their vision? What are their goals for this? Um, but from our perspective, um, of course, enhancing existing uh, vibrant inclusive neighborhoods. This is uh, 15 miles of very diverse uh, neighborhoods, each with with its own character. Um, so um, kind of pulling this together and into one um, kind of linear project um, is not going to make sense. And so we have split this up into four different sub areas. Um, you can't see from the map here, but essentially we're going to be looking at um, doing planning differently in each sub area. So there's going to be a north sub area. Uh, from about Speedway north to the Tucson Mall. There's going to be a central downtown sub area uh, from uh, Speedway south to about the city of South Tucson border at 25th. Um, and then a city of South Tucson sub area. It's its own municipality, so uh, we thought it makes sense for it to be its own um, kind of its own entity with this project. 
Um, and then the south side, which would be essentially from I-19 south to the Tucson airport. Um, we're also going to be looking at uh, development that matches, of course, the character of the surrounding area. So, you know, that's really where DRB, you know, you guys come in and kind of helping us identify once we get further along in this project and get a lot of public outreach, you know, what some of that, you know, you know design characteristics may look like, whether we look at a zoning overlay uh, and so forth. Um, but certainly looking at a mix of, of multifamily uh, housing types, you know, that kind of missing middle housing that we talk about a lot. Uh, and that can provide more affordable options. Um, the small apartment buildings, the duplexes, triplexes, uh, townhomes, um, and then looking at job creation that employs local residents as part of this and developing policies and plans um, specifically around that, um, adding amenities and public gathering spaces. Um, and I think one thing that's not on here, but uh, we've already been hearing a lot of feedback on, of course, is preservation of uh, local culture, character, um, and certainly local businesses. Uh, there's a lot of local businesses, a lot of mom and pop shops um, along the full stretch of, of this corridor. Um, specific outcomes may include financial strategies, uh, policies for preserving affordable housing and adding mixed income housing. Um, we've done a market assessment already that identifies all of the vacant properties along the corridor, um, land that the city may purchase or private developers may purchase for future uh, mixed use development, public space, um, other amenities. Um, and then again, I you know, mentioned that zoning update. Um, we could do something similar to the Sunshine Mile zoning overlay. Um, and that would be, uh, we'd essentially be doing that over the course of next year. Um, but we're going to be collecting more outreach um, for the next six months or so. Uh, we're in the middle of community outreach right now, and so we've launched a, a project website where you can find more information. That's TucsonNorte-Sword.com, uh, um, and on that website, you can find a survey as well, uh, and I'll put the survey link in the chat so you can all fill out the survey. It only takes about five minutes, um, collecting a lot of basic information. Um, we'll have a follow-up survey with more detail probably in the fall, um, but we've done one round of open house meetings so far. Um, we'll do two more rounds, uh, one in May, and uh, we should have those dates set really soon, and then one again in October um, or November. Um, we're going to be doing seven focus groups around specific topic areas um, related to transit-oriented development, so economic development jobs will be one. Um, transit, uh, transit service itself will be another, um, arts and culture, uh, public space, parks, um, so seven different focus groups. We're going to have six community dialogues, which will be more of kind of an open ended conversation led by um, community ambassadors. And you can see this photo is actually um, we've we've hired uh, a dozen community ambassadors. And so these are, um, you know, neighborhood leaders. These are people who are really kind of boots in the ground in the neighborhoods doing a lot of advocacy work and really have strong connections um, in the neighborhoods along the corridor. And so they're going to be working with us and kind of being a liaison between the neighborhoods and the city and providing information and vice versa. Um, and so they're going to be leading these conversations, which will be sort of an open ended dialogue um, about, you know, what are the what's the vision? Um, what are the concerns? What are the constraints um, and so forth? And then we're going to be doing 12 pop up events at existing um, festivals, events going on around town over the next several months. This uh, is the, the timeline and um, you don't need to worry about all the specific bullet points, but essentially um, two more years in this planning effort. So we'll be wrapping up community outreach this fall um, and then moving into recommendations um, this winter and throughout next year, developing those specific policies, plans, um, zoning overlay, uh, what have you. So uh, and with that, I will take any questions. I had a, a few. Um, hi, I'm Susanna. Um, that's exciting. Um, I'm pretty familiar with transit oriented development, um, but I appreciate the equity part because that's been an issue with a lot. Um, I guess the first thing is, is this presentation public information? Because I live in one of the neighborhoods, so I wondered if it's OK to pass it on. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I can provide the link to that um, and 
um, I can send the link to Maria to pass around. Um, we'll also be posting it, or I could post it directly to the website as well. Um, so we'll be putting up information on the website as we go, okay. but yes. And, and the other thing was, um, obviously the interconnection with the, the other transportation in Tucson is pretty key, but I guess that's what you're going to be working on. Just out of personal um, inquiry, is this going to be similar to the streetcar? Because one of the issues I think with that is it's so slow. Yeah. Is this going to be the same? <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't know at this point. Um, so, you know, there is, we're not ruling anything out, but most likely this will be bus rapid transit. Um, this is a, a long corridor and and as you mentioned, streetcar especially is maybe not suited for 14 and a half miles, like um, something like bus rapid transit, but you know, potentially light rail, um, although that's very expensive um, compared to bus rapid transit and kind of those up front costs are, are very different from <laughs> light rail to bus rapid transit. Um, but BRT or bus rapid transit would be new, a uh, new transit type in Tucson, um, one that we haven't seen. And so a lot of this is going to be kind of educating people on kind of what that looks like, providing examples from around the U.S. And really in the U.S., it's it's also pretty new. There's a, um, a good example of BRT now in Albuquerque, which is, of course, pretty similar to Tucson. Um, they went right down there kind of Route 66 um, Central Avenue Main Street. So um, we're going to see kind of how that performs. Um, can you tell us what bus rapid trans is it just like buses that go fast? Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's kind of like a rapid bus, but like a rapid bus plus. So it's um, yeah, larger buses, so more capacity. You know, the articulated buses um, often have a dedicated lane. So, you know, not sharing traffic with vehicles, which uh, certainly speeds up the service. Nicer stations than, you know, not just a bus stop. It looks more like a streetcar station, essentially, um, with real time arrival information. Um, kind of has all the trappings of like a light rail system um, and, you know, but is, is a bus uh, essentially. But yeah, would run, you know, more frequently um, as well and stop less often than a traditional bus. So stops every half mile to a mile. So really kind of at major um, destinations or, or intersections. So when you say an articulated bus, is that like a, a double, like a bus and then a section on the back that that hinges? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. We should get the double decker ones, the used ones from uh, London, and we can pay them a different color. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Put some Suaros on there. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, this is Carol, this is Carol Clement. I was wondering. Oh, let me turn on my camera. I was wondering how will this development impact uh, bicycle travel lanes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we're going to this is the focus of this project really is to make multimodal corridors. So there's not going to be any roadway widening as part of this. Um, the street may be re redesigned, of course, to accommodate the buses, but would also be thinking about, OK, how do we safely get, you know, walk to the transit? How do we safely bike to the transit? And on the corridors itself, you know, some of them have bike lanes right now. Stone Avenue has a bike lane. South Six has a bike lane for stretches, but they're not ideal. They're on. just painted striped bike lanes. So building something that's more protected as part of this project, maybe, um, you know, maybe part of it um, really making these more complete streets. That will be a tight fit. Potentially, it really depends on the corridor. Um, yeah, in some areas it could be a tight fit, but um, in some areas the bus may have to share traffic with vehicles too, kind of where there's just not the lane capacity there. Yeah. And if I may also ask, I'm assuming that the infill with amenities will also mean like small grocery stores, doctor's office, maybe uh, libraries. I don't know those hardware stores, those kind of things that people would use would like in their immediate neighborhood. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, that's what we're hoping to get feedback from people on um, with all these outreach events is really what they'd like to see in their neighborhoods and you know what form that should take, what it should look like um, and where it should go. Yeah, those will be the questions we'll be asking. Yep. And Rosemary Bright, I just had a couple questions. Um, 
One question I had was, are there going to be any zoning changes needed to allow for density increases along the corridor? Well, we we, we might be looking at a zoning overlay. Um, and so providing additional options on top of the zoning that's there right now for people to, to potentially build higher densities. Um, yeah, and similar to Sunshine Mile, we're really kind of Tracking how that goes, it's sort of a similar effort in some ways, um, you know, without a lot of the kind of advanced public outreach, um, you know, they had a much more limited budget, but um, they also are looking at this transit oriented development, right? And adding more density to Broadway and certain areas around transit. OK, great. And then um, are there any elements of smart streets that will need to be incorporated with our existing infrastructure to make this work? Um, we don't know at this point. That's something the transit services is going to be working on. Um, yeah, especially as we start to identify what type of transit technology we're talking about. Um, there may be different aspects of like signal prioritization that, that you know that happen as as part of the project. Yeah, but that would be much further down the line. And once we get funding for transit, because at this point we don't have the funding for the transit itself. We're also applying for funding um, as this plan is taking place. What's the estimated cost? Well, we don't have we don't have an estimated cost at this point for the full project. Um, you know, you could look at kind of similar projects that other cities have done. I think Albuquerque's was you know twelve miles and uh, about one hundred and fifty million total uh, for their bus rapid transit line. Okay, thanks. Of course, that was built you know a few years ago, so things may have changed. Any, Any more questions? questions? Yeah, thank you, Ian, for for taking the time out this morning to tell us about it. And thank you. I'm going to put the survey it, in the chat quick. Great, Maria. Is this just an FYI, or is there any um, connection with this plan and the future responsibilities of the DRB? It will potentially fall into responsibilities of the DRB. Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, but, you know, we're taking advantage of your expertise <laughs> also to provide some initial feedback since you most likely will be seeing projects down the road in the future, um, you know, related to to actions that may be taken as a result of this uh, study. And uh, and also we're just doing our due diligence, right? Keep our uh, boards and commissions and committees updated, and and uh, and also the intention is to come back to the DRB and others uh, as the milestones are being reached for these projects. Um, just trying to be comprehensive, and so we don't show up to you at the last second with here's a project <laughs> related to the Tucson uh, Norte Sur, right? And uh, so that's what we're doing, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, if there are no other questions. Quick, quick last question. Ian, is the survey to be spread far and wide? Is that the goal? Yes, we're really going to be kind of emphasizing the survey in the study area, so a half mile or so from the corridor, and we'll be sending out uh, mailers about the survey, but it can be filled out by anybody in the city of Tucson. Yes. And uh, Mr. Chair, Ms. Ms. Dickinson, members of the DRB, um, Ian's presentation is on the DRB, DRB's uh, web page. It's available to you, and please feel free to, to share with others. OK, let's move on to our next presentation. Please. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Dan Bursick. I am from Planning and Development Services. We kind of been putting these two items in tandem because Infill Incentive District is one of the tools for transit oriented development that we currently have, and we are going to be going through an update. So I'm going to share my screen here, um, hopefully. And I'll try to keep it relatively short um, for you today, considering we have an applicant who is waiting right now. So um, with that, hold on a second, Let's figure out where I'm at here. Can't. That's okay. Anyway, okay. Um, so um, thank you so much for uh, for for joining. 
um, and having me here today. Uh, the Infill Incentive District, as many of you may know, is an overlay, a zoning overlay, essentially, that runs um, mostly downtown, but also runs up north to Grant Road along Stone and Oracle, um, as well as down south to really, um, you know, it hits a little bit of the, the kind of west side Mercado area, um, but also down to really the border with uh, South Tucson. And uh, we uh, looked at this about three years ago, and when we did so, they put a sunset date on it. So. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background on um, kind of where this has been um, uh, as far as like revisions over the last you know 10 plus years or so. Um, so the kind of um, the shape of the Infill Incentive District and how it functions was really brought together around 2010. Um, there was a big process um, related to it um, as far as the development of it um, to create these kind of zoning standards uh, within it. Um, public review, uh, there were about 100 plus meetings or so. Um, after 2010, there were a handful of projects um, in and around downtown and 4th Avenue um, that uh, kind of weren't really thought to as meeting the desired outcome. Um, they resulted in demolition of historic structures. There were places like the district, which people felt were a little bit out of scale with um, with the surrounding areas. Um, so um, in 2013, mayor and council directed staff to revise portions of um, this, um, of the infill incentive district, uh, and then to also try to simplify it and then incorporate it. There were a lot of other pieces, right? There's the downtown links portion that was its own overlay. Um, there was the Rio Nuevo district, which I believe you do re help with review on that um, as well, that was over this portion. And the goal was really to bring these together and try to simplify a bit and then address some of those issues, especially related to historic. Um, so between 2013 and 2015, um, there was analysis, deliberation, and public review related to this. Again, another 100 plus public meetings. There was a stakeholder, there were stakeholder groups. There was a task force that helped to guide a lot of this. Um, and then there was also a subcommittee um, of the Planning Commission to kind of help and study this throughout. Um, ultimately, in 2000 and February 18th, 2015, um, those new changes were adopted. And that's really what you see now with the Infill Incentive District. They put a sunset date on that at that point again um, of January 31st, 2019. Um, so in 2018, we went back and spent close to a year, it was about nine months or so, reviewing um, really the sunset date and the effectiveness of the ordinance at the time. Um, it was thought that it's working relatively well, um, and but they also felt that, you know, looking forward, there would be changes that we should look at in the future. So at the time, they adopted it with some minor updates, um, and then they extended the sunset date to January 31st, 2023, which, as you likely know, is coming up upon us pretty quickly. It's about 10 months away. Um, so now we're back and looking at the Infill Incentive District. Um, as far as an update for this. Um, so back in 2019, some of that direction of changes of things to look at, um, you know, monitor current parking conditions and trends to inform the code and policy changes, um, conduct research to better understand areas that have seen less development, um, look for opportunities uh, and existing incentives to promote transit oriented development and connectivity to transit. Um, explore design guidelines on better transitions between some of the areas. So the design guidelines in the infill incentive district don't always match up, especially along some of the, 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 the sub districts essentially. Um, and then explore a housing study um, to determine how to deal with student housing and affordability issues um, in and around the area. Um, some of the projects, just to give you an idea of kind of what the Infill Incentive District does, it works really well in a couple different ways. One, it works really well for adaptive reuse, and this is an example of it. The Bacher Bacher Cider House, um, it was completed in 2020. It was adaptive reuse of a retail space that turned into a bar, essentially. Um, normally, because of parking and landscaping um, restrictions within our current code and underlying code, this wouldn't have been, have been able to do. So they were able to get modifications, especially parking is a really huge one um, to allow for this to go in. Um, it also works really well for um, for kind of more urban, larger scale kind of um, residential. So this is an example of um, of an, a senior affordable housing uh, development. Uh, this is the Marist. Um, this is at the corner of Church and Broadway. Um, this one included modifications. Uh, 
setbacks reduction, uh, setback reductions, parking reductions, landscape waivers. Um, the thing that you get in exchange for this, and you, I know a lot of you have worked with the infill incentive district and do really have, have, have an understanding of this, um, is essentially just, you know, you go through a design review process. The goals here is that you have a better design, more pedestrian friendly design transit rate development in exchange for waivers um, and, and more flexibility in your standards, essentially. Um, and then another one that that has come in since then, since that last as was the Flynn um, that was completed in 2021. Um, and this is 243 market rate uni uh, units right on the streetcar downtown, also at the corner of Church and Broadway. Um, so since the last time we did this, there has been kind of court that we're looking at doing. There's been other efforts that have been going on and we're looking at coordination to make sure that we're building upon this instead of starting over, essentially. Um, so since then, we uh, went through and we've done a we did a market study in 2020 um, for housing market to get an understanding of really where that's been. It's changed a bit, obviously, since the pandemic, um, but it will help to inform this. Um, in 2021, there was the Central Business District Report and GPLET policy, so we made adjustments to the GPLET. Um, there was also a PIVO report related to that that helps to kind of understand the market and, um, and, and what the market will bear. Um, there has been a housing and affordability strategy for Tucson that has been passed. Um, this had a lot of strategies related to affordable housing policy and zoning policy. Um, Tucson Convention Center Master Plan has been un undergoing all kinds of changes. Um, so looking at that um, and then obviously, um, you know, the equitable or transit oriented development, which is the Tucson uh, Norte sewer that uh, Ian was just talking about quarter planning, move Tucson. There have been a lot of other transportation investments that have been going on. Um, so building upon those, but also coordinating with those as we move forward. Um, just kind of related to that to give you an understanding of um, kind of the overlap between these two. Um, so the map on the right shows the kind of magenta purple is the infill incentive district. And then the green is the, I guess, tentative study area. It may move over to stone as uh, as Ian was talking about, depending on the study. But um, but really it overlaps with the majority other than, I guess, this weird tail of the coyote, as they say, um, if it's a coyote, I don't know what this would be if it is. But um, anyways, so there are a lot of really common goals in the infill incentive district is uh, one of our best tools, along with, you know, some of our other overlays like the Sunshine Mile overlay for transit oriented development. So we're coordinating closely and kind of coordinating on feedback to make sure that as things come up, um, as things come up throughout this, that if there are ideas or things that should be incorporated in the infill incentive district, we're, we're capitalizing upon that during the update and taking care of trying to include them now. Um, it is entirely possible that, you know, as we get further on down the road, we'll have to make additional changes to either the infill incentive district or that whole new overlay. Um, but we're trying to make sure that a lot of the feedback that's coming in from, from the Tucson Norte sewer will help to inform this as well um, where there is that overlap. So we just wanted to kind of point point upon that. So we've been joining them. We went and joined them for their workshops that they had workshops in each of the different segments a couple of weeks ago. Um, we kind of presented at uh, Cyclovia um, with them as well um, to kind of get that feedback and kind of you know have that coordinated effort. Um, so some of the policy areas that we see um, that may need to be addressed through this through this process are items like affordable housing incentives. So if you are aware of the Sunshine Mile overlay, um, there was there is an incentive for affordable housing in certain areas, a, you know, a, basically a density bonus or other types of things if you provide a per certain percentage of housing. So we're looking to do something similar here, something that that really fits the infill incentive district. Um, looking at the post-pandemic future of downtown impacts on office space, public space, et cetera. Um, so as we know, um, more people are working remotely or they're working part-time in the office. And what does that mean? What does that mean for office space downtown? And if we need to create standards to help that transition to something else or transition the way it is, that's something we're also looking at. Um, changes to design standards, especially downtown links. As you know, the construction is uh, Moving forward, um, it's getting, I think, relative, not, not that close, it's probably maybe halfway there, but um, as that builds out, there's going to be more and more interest there. We need to make sure that those design standards are appropriate. Um, and then any zoning or development standards that may need to be changed. Um, and then administrative changes, if there's red tape or 
areas that we can streamline that make that we're basically requiring things that aren't necessary or aren't really improving the quality of design or development, looking at those as well. Um, so these are things we see. Uh, we will be doing um, stakeholder meetings and reaching out to the public and have surveys to try to see if there's other things, especially from you know the neighbors from the from the residential community, but also from developers and people who have utilized this. Um, so just kind of related to that. And some of the next steps. So right now we're doing data analysis and research, um, looking at vacancy rates of office and retail downtown, doing um, doing kind of window surveys to kind of get an understanding of, of or ground flow surveys to get an understanding of what's going on. Um, we have kind of uh, we also have um, some market studies going on of really the Tucson market and what can work. Uh, additionally, um, we are going to continue to do outreach at public events, like we did with Seclovia and the uh, the workshop. Um, but we're we're going to hold our first stakeholder meeting on April 26th. If anybody here, we some of you may have been on our list, I think. Um, but if you're interested in joining us, we're doing kind of a listening session. It's a larger group, but a listening session to kind of get an understanding of this. Uh, please let us know, and we're happy to send you an invite to that. Um, and then we are working on a survey as well. Um, I know it can get confusing, so we're trying to time it out properly with the other survey that's going on for the North Bay sewer. Uh, but we will be distributing a survey um, to get a better understanding of really how the IID has worked, but also how people are utilizing downtown. So it's gonna be really important to get an understanding of that. And I know it's shifting and continually changing, um, but we're hoping that that'll help to inform some of those decisions as we move forward. So um, with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions from you. I'm gonna put, the, we, we did uh, develop a website for this, uh, which has a lot of background information and has links to a story map that tells the story of downtown, um, as well as we'll put it, we're, we're planning on putting all of our events on there. So I'm gonna put that in the chat for everyone. Um, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Hi, Dan, it's Rosemary Bright. Hey, Rosemary, how are you doing? Doing well, thanks. Just one question. When does mayor and council plan to uh, vote on this? Um, so I, I, ultimately, we have to ha have some sort of action for mayor and council prior to January 31st, 2023. Um, so there is always the possibility if we are getting close and then we need more time, they might be able to extend that sunset date, but otherwise, all of the regu the regulations revert. So we would have to take action prior to January 31st. So it's pretty soon. Um, I have a feeling we may end up at having to extend it a little bit, but we're hoping not to. Thanks. Yep. Hey, Dan, this is uh, Chris Stevie. I have a quick question on process. Is there uh, part of this kind of relook at it um, administratively, when you're actually moving through this process, I've done a couple of these in the downtown area. There is quite the disconnect between IID and what we would typically do for a development plan or a construction document set. So we've run into problems where, or not problems, but challenges on projects where we've had IID approval. And then we've gone and developed, you know, the detail required from mine and I'm a landscape architect. So, you know, from the landscape and site development part of it, it the requirements on the IID are pretty minimal as to what you show. It, 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 it's not a full construction plan, but we've had some challenges with, you know, and then to get other things approved, we've had to take plans to a more depth, more in depth detailing and then go back to the IID and then there's revisions and then you go back to the construction documents or, you know, getting your develop because you got to put in a development plan and have it rejected in order to go IID, right? So you, you've got to put in a junk set to get to the overlay and then your overlay supersedes the DP. So then you're, you're, you have all these documents that need to talk to each other, but they administratively do not talk to each other um, yeah. very cleanly. And I'd, I'd love to see some more interaction between development services at the development plan and IID, which kind of have different groups reviewing them. Um, because when you start talking about these sites, they're typically very tight, they're non-conforming, and we need special considerations to be 
provided for those projects. So if, if we could maybe get uh, more, not just community outreach, but your A&E community direct outreach or overview or maybe review of some revisions or maybe pull together a smaller focus group of uh, civil engineers and landscape architects and architects to maybe help Look, you know, ones that have gone through the process and get some direct feedback on what could be smoother. Because I just, we just went through one on, uh, I'm not going to name the project, but it was right downtown. And we've been, it's been, it was probably two years, 18 months at least. That's not quick for a client, yeah. especially a private developer client. That That's a lot of money on the table holding. Hey, yeah, Chris. Chris, that's really great. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Nick. Or I was just going to say, Chris, you totally just with that comment earned your annual salary from the design review board. Thank you. <laughs> that's helpful. It yeah, seems like that yeah. would be a helpful comment. Hey, Chris, that's a, that's a really great comment. Um, so one thing that we are planning to do initially, we're going to hold this kind of first listening session with our stakeholder group. That's a larger group and we'd love to have you included. Um, we are looking to have um, some focus areas, and this makes me think that yes, an administrative kind of focus area, looking at the process and how we can adjust that, or or just you know streamline it or make it work better, is is would be really helpful. So no, that's great feedback. We'll we'll look to do that. There's a couple hands. Uh, well, let's see. There's a hand up on my screen. Carol, you have been waiting with your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you, Nathan. Uh, Daniel, uh, Carol Clement, I'm Carol Clement. Could you please discuss any design efforts or plans that will include sustainable green infrastructure designs, any efforts that will be made to reduce the urban heat island effect? I see in your presentation that some of the landscape requirements are being uh, reduced and all I see in your presentation to be honest with you is a lot of concrete. Yeah, Carol, so that's something that actually did come up in our last um, last time that we were looking at this. So part of the issue is that the infill incentive district is downtown and you're in kind of built out areas where there isn't a lot of room necessarily for um, you know, for that landscaping, that's where the landscaping reduction comes in is the fact that a lot of times, especially like uh, the Bacher Bacher Cider House, they're really, I mean, it was a building that was already there. So that's why you end up with a lot of those reductions or it allows for you to shift it from one place to another place. Um, that's where those those landscape reductions come in. Um, one thing we will be looking at as well is um, kind of integration with some of those other. I I, I think it was they talked about you know green open space things of that sort. Um, we did recently put a cool roof requirement um, for our accessory dwelling units ordinance, so we may be looking at items such as that um, with this. That could be definitely be a part of that conversation. Um, but until we get into the process, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what that will look like, but that's something we can definitely look at. Yes, I hope so, because I, I really found that very. Um, oh, uh, it, it seemed to not be addressed at all in the presentation you gave us today. Oversight, it seems like nope. it's going to be yep. an add on oversight at the last minute and it won't be good enough. So I so I will say one thing is that we do have other initiatives going on in the city related to our, our zoning standards and, and building standards um, to where we are making changes, but it's more citywide um, and there will be we're going to be looking at climate adaptive development standards. So those changes. So we need to make sure that those also align. But there are other efforts going on, not necessarily this one, um, but those do need to be integrated. So it will be a part of that conversation. Okay, thank you. I, I guess just following up on that. Hi, I'm Susanna Dickinson. Coming from the architectural aspect that. You know, it's the buildings that, you know, hopefully in that new. Um, push that you're talking about, the buildings will have more sustainable criteria. Because right now, I mean, a cool roof isn't going to get where we need to go. 
you know, in terms of facade treatment, realizing different directions need different amounts of shading, water collection, things like that. Um, so hopefully that'll be, it won't just be the, the landscape that is considered green. So just push for that. Yeah, so one thing that we have done um, on our urban overlays that hasn't necessarily been done in the infill incentive district is it has environmentally conscious practices to where every development has to do a certain amount and get a certain amount of points related to that. Um, so that's another thing that could potentially be integrated within the infill incentive district as well. It was developed before those other overlays, so it could be something that we've, we've applied there that we can bring here as well. Yeah, hopefully that happens because a lot of the recent development is very generic and that would really help bring kind of the character back to the city. I mean, on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the DRB, um, if uh, any of you is planning on attending any of these um, focus group meetings, we just got to make sure that we don't end up with a quorum <laughs> at these the, uh, this focus group meetings. <laughs> so a um, um, quorum constitutes uh, three, at least three members of the DRB. So uh, Dan, I don't know if there's, if you know, members of the DRB are really interested on in participating. If there's a way to break up these focus group meetings into two or something just to accommodate uh, for the DRB members attending if they wish to. Yeah, Maria, we'll we'll take a look at if there is interest that it gets to the point to where there might be a quorum. We can we can kind of address that and figure it out. So if the DRB shows up in a quorum, does that automatically shut down any city meeting? So it's like a, it could be a form of protest. Three of us show up, <laughs> canceled. Is that well? Is that you know, I think it's, do, it's doable. It's doable, but we would need to uh, advertise. You know, we would need to publish it that there's a DRB meeting taking place. Wow. Um, okay. All right. Well, I want to say thank you to Dan for for taking the time to present to us that that initiative and thanks to the DRB for um, their comments, some very helpful comments actually, I think were collected there. Let's move on to agenda item number five, which is case number DRB 2203. And I'll ask um, the Tucson staff for a summary and then we can have the presentation from the applicant. Uh, yes, Mr. Kapler, I have uh, one of my colleagues present here, Lena Porrell. She's um, a planner for the entitlement section. She's uh, leading this project, so I'll, I'm going to ask her to make the introduction. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Lena Porrell, lead planner with Planning and Development Services. Uh, so this is a request by Lexi Wallet, project manager for the Planning Center on behalf of the property owner, the city of Tucson for minor technology improvements to the existing Tucson water well E016 as a spe special exception land use in the R1 zone. Uh, the proposed improvements include one adding tan privacy, privacy slats to the existing chain link fence, as well as a new 10 foot landscape border along 22nd Street. Construction an additional nine feet tall shade structure to protect the existing electrical control panel, designed similar to the existing shade structure and painted to match the existing equipment on site. Three, repairing or replacing existing equipment, and four, installing SCADA upgrades. Distribution system uses in the R1 zone are subject to sections 4.9, point 11, point A, point 1, point 2, point 5. 0.8, and 0.11 of the Unified Development Code and require approval through a zoning examiner special exception procedure, section 3.4.3, as well as reviewed by the Design Review Board. Uh, this item is scheduled for a zoning examiner public hearing on May 5th, 2022. Um, and the DRB's purview in accordance with UDC section 4.9.11.8, 
5.8. Um, any building housing such facility shall be in keeping with the character of the zone in which it's located. The design review board shall review all applications and make recommendations to the zoning examiner. The DRB shall review architectural style, building elevations, material on exterior facades, color schemes, new mechanical equipment locations, light of outdoor areas, um, and windows. Um, and yeah, that's it. So I will pass it over to Lexi for who's the applicant. Uh, good morning, everyone. Lexi Wellett with the Planning Center. I'm a project manager and we're located at 2 East Congress, Suite 600 in downtown Tucson. I'm also joined this morning um, by Greg Poniotes with the Planning Center as well. Um, many of you are familiar with this this project, but seeing some or uh, these types of projects, but seeing uh, some new faces here on the line, I'll, I'll walk through and give a brief introduction um, as to what the SCADA process is and the upgrades are. So, um, this the site we're looking at specifically today is located um, off of 26th Street, which is uh, just north of 29th and uh, west of Harrison Road, and what we're looking at proposing here is some um, minor upgrades to the site. And so basically Tucson Water has been, as many of you are, are familiar with now, um, Tucson Water has been um, embarking on a process of upgrading a lot of their technologies on existing well sites located in the inner city um, and in Midtown and, and some wells on the periphery. Um, they're upgrading their technologies on the site. Some of the technologies include computer systems, others are new wells, um, new, new infrastructure, et cetera. But on these three cases um, before you all today, these are all computer upgrades. So basically, um, Tucson Water is proposing to install new computers which control their, their SCADA system. And SCADA is a supervisory control and data acquisition system. And basically, this system is a monitoring system that monitors uh, water pressure, water distribution, water quality, the rate of which it's being distributed, et cetera. And so a lot of the systems on these well sites are antiquated and, and this process is to simply install new technology. However, as part of the installation of the technology, Tucson Water is proposing uh, new structures on the sites. Oftentimes it's a, a shade structure or a, a 10 by 10 uh, by 10 control building. So um, the, the presence of the structure itself is what's necessitating the special exception process here. So just to run um, you all through the site that we're looking at particularly um, today, this site has been an active well since uh, I believe the 1960s and has functioned on this site since that time. There's not been any um, uh, periods where it has been inactive and there's currently only one well on the property. Um, many of these sites often have multiple wells that have been uh, shut down or decommissioned, but this site in particularly just has one. So, um, Tori and everybody, the, the site is located on 26th Street. It's a relatively large property um, and the well yard is set back um, quite quite some distance from the, the road itself. Um, there is a large drainage way that is on the east side of the property, as well as an alleyway that um, borders the, the east and southern boundary, and that uh, serves as the um, environmental services and trash collection for the neighborhood. So the alleyways um, that border the site, it's, it's imperative that those keep open so um, trash services for the neighborhood can continue. Um, to be provided. Um, so to look at the, the well yard itself, currently it's enclosed in a, a six foot chain link fence that has some privacy slats in the fence on some sides. It's got wooden slats. Um, as part of this process, we'll remove all slats and refresh it with some new vinyl um, slats that, that um, you guys are familiar with. But in addition to um, the well itself, we've got a 5,000 gallon hydro tank, an electrical transformer box that is owned by TEP. And then we've got an existing shade structure that uh, and control panels that house the current um, electrical control systems and the, the current SCADA system that's on there. So again, as part of this process, we're 
asking uh, for an exception to install a new shade structure that looks very similar to the one um, that is currently on the site. The image here on the right is what is currently um, in the southern corner here. So the new shade structure will be placed right next to it. This shade structure is approximately nine feet in height, which is uh, about the same height as the, the current structure um, on the site. And then other improvements um, that Tucson Water is proposing on this site is to install a landscape border along 26th Street. Um, I included the landscape plans that are prepared for this, which include maintenance schedule, vegetation type. So they will be planning um, uh, plants in this and then um, Tucson Water is, will be uh, installing new decorative rock throughout the remainder of the yard for dust abatement to control um, and some of those, those um, perhaps nuances there that may be disruptive to the neighborhood. And then additionally, they, there is some additional discussion about um, whether or not uh, additional vegetation can in, uh, be installed beyond um, the fence, but there is private utilities that run through here and uh, just some, some challenges with the site. So currently Tucson Water is committed to, to planting the uh, 10 foot landscape border per, per city requirements. So to run you all through uh, just very briefly what it is we're doing again, Tucson Water is requesting a special exception to a Equip the existing well site with new technology upgrades. The improvements include installing a new shade structure to uh, cover the new and existing electronic controls. They'll be up including the, uh, installing the new computer upgrades. They'll be repairing and replacing existing equipment as needed. If so, if there's an antiquated pipe or whatever, something that uh, is in disrepair, they'll replace that as well while they're out there. Um, and then uh, installing privacy slats and the 10 foot landscape border and then everything else on the same of the site, the way it's accessed, the chain link fencing, the overall well site, um, the location and the, the configuration will all be maintained. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to you all for any questions you may have regarding uh, this, this case. Hmm. All right, um, Carol, is your hand up? Yes, it is. Um, nice. Where could I take a look at the uh, landscape plans, Lexi? Do you have them? Could you share them with us now? And I bet you can guess what the reason why I'm asking, because if you recall the last time we had a meeting with one of these kind of sites, I requested that the uh, passive water harvesting basins be shown on plants on plans so that they are indeed built. Yes, let me try and let me pull it up for you real quick, Carol. And I, I did instruct that to occur. But. <laughs> I do agree with Carol because what we have here is basically a utility yard and and the utilities should it's making a message of utilities and we should make a message of uh, renewing and being a good steward of the utilities. So the passive water collection should be attempted in each one of these things because we are extracting water, but we can also show how it's, it can be used from the surface. And then I, I also thought maybe the shade could incorporate some minor solar panels too. Um, there's no reason why we, we can't have our utility yards make that statement. Nice, yeah, make them green. Yeah, they, they won't be net zero or anything like that, but at least it will um, show, show people that uh, the utility companies are thinking about these things as well as, a, a, you know, leading, it, it's a po point of leadership. So it shows up here on the the right side. I mean, on the left side of the plan here, Carol, it says the landscape recess six inch throughout for water harvesting. And these areas, um, 
I'm I'm uh, happy if yeah. there is additional information that you would like shown on these plans. I'm happy to to include those as as we move. If if that detail doesn't suffice, um, I'm happy to instruct uh, our landscape architects as we move through these processes to ensure that is included on these plans there. Um, and and to your your um, question. Nathan, um, I, I can relay that information to Tucson Water. I think there has been more of an active approach to make these sites more um, site reliant, if you will, um, and that they can provide their own energy. So I think that's a, a shift that Tucson Water is looking to, to make, but I'll, I'll definitely make sure I pass that information on. Great. Uh, Lexi, may I see the details? The planting details does it show how to build a basin on the detail sheet uh doesn't look like it i would suggest that you put in a passive water harvesting basin detail yes that shows the side slopes no steeper than one to five one to three and shows a flat bottom and shows it three to four inches deep what they have now, it'll just be a hole in the ground that's six inches deep and they'll put the plants in the middle of it. I don't think it's sufficient what is shown now on the plans. Okay, I can definitely have them add that detail. I know we did add on the last per your comments, we've now got a maintenance schedule um, on here as well. So I'm hopeful we're getting closer there, uh, Ms. Clements, to, to sufficing um, for to make sure that this gets built. And that is something just so the DRB is aware um, what we're currently working on the planning center with Tucson Water is to try and establish more design guidelines to, to help facilitate this process and ensure that it, it happens. Um, so hopefully that's something we'll, we'll be working through and, and we'll be able to, to address these concerns uh, into perpetuity, if you will. So we're, we're working on it, we're on it, and I, I'm happy to have our guys uh, add some uh, detail for the water harvesting basins on these to ensure that that's, that's done correctly. Just to make myself perfectly clear, I will not approve this plan as is. I will want to see it resubmitted with water harvesting basin details. Is that part of our purview? Um, we're, that's a development services question, Carol. Uh, development services requires water harvesting per the water harvesting guidelines within the city development code. We're here for not necessarily technical review of a project plan. I, I'm, I'm wary. I'm wary of giving direct direction to a client or to an applicant about how to revise their plans or technical issues that are development services purview in this meeting. Well, let's let's review our purview. Um, I, I know there's a lot of. Uh, um, if we could put that part of the agenda back on. It's the UDC 4911 A8, which, as we all know, is detailed further down in the in the uh, agenda. If we could page down there, Maria. Oh no, is this it? Th this little section is right here. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do we need to keep the, the facility in the character of the zone in which it's located, which is residential? And we can make recommendations to the zoning examiner. We need to review architectural style, elevations, materials, exterior, exterior facades, color schemes, equipment locations, light, outdoor windows, Screening, landscaping. Chris, I believe we can make recommendations. Um, we shall review landscaping, vehicular use areas, and other contributing design features. I would think that a um, uh, passive water harvesting is falls within landscaping, and and it's certainly a design feature. So I don't think it's too much of a stretch to ask them to do that. I just want to make sure we're not giving direct revision consultation to an applicant. Um, uh, I, I do know that we can say we don't agree with what they're showing or that we're not going to approve this, but I, I don't know if we're able to say I'm not going to approve this until you provide X, Y, or Z. Um, and, and, yeah. and if I may add, 
if I may add, as as the requirements are, uh, Mr. Stevie is 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 very correct. It is it, uh, it will be reviewed, um, and and those water harvesting basins will uh, will be identified at the time of of construction. So they will be put in. Um, and our plans indicated, I, I can revise the plan and, and I assure you that we can do that um, moving forward, but we would respectfully ask that we continue uh, the ability to move forward on this because there is some time sensitivity on so, making, to, to meet the construction timeline for well, this. Lexi, is, is this considered a commercial property? Are you required to do a rainwater harvesting plan for these? Yes. I believe so. Yes. So part of your development service, part of your development services package that needs to get approved before you can get a permit to install this project is going to require you to show and 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 uh, illustrate that you're going to be able to provide 50% of the required irrigation water for this site within three years via water harvesting on the site. That is correct, Mr. So Chief. adding that detail that Carol was just mentioning and details on that plan set are going to be part of your review with development services and part of that process in order for you to get a permit, correct? I believe so, yes. Right. So Carol, does that does that appease does that appease some of your, your comment of like where you're where they're headed? I, I feel like they're gonna they're gonna be forced to provide what you're asking via the development services process. Uh Larry, um, yes, but you guys know I've gone to these sites and and physically and never do I see those requirements being built. So what I, I've, I've gone to a couple sites and it's not done. So how do we, I mean, I'm, we're, I'm probably stepping out of our purview here, but how do we get this so that the guys in the field build it? Words on a plan don't show it, but maybe they would look at details. I don't know. I'm just perhaps. Well, Make a suggestion. I, I don't know. I don't know how to well, solve this. Well, if I could, um, uh, the water harvesting is important to Carol as her uh, as a design review element. And Chris is saying that we're not allowed to um, implement our own details onto their plan set, but we are allowed to say we are allowed to add emphasis to the water harvesting. Chris has actually just kind of informed the group of. Uh, uh, subsequent processes where all this will get added in anyways. So our purview is to review the elements of, of the design and water harvesting is an element. It does say that on the site plan, it's not very beefy in the details, but that's not for us to help okay. them construct plans that meet our satisfaction. The It is on the site plan though. So maybe that, maybe that, um, it, that plus sort of the information that Chris shared about subsequent processes might uh, sway your vote here, Carol. Any other comments, or are we are we ready to um, entertain a a motion on this case? There's not much architectural style to comment on chain link fence with vinyl slats. We didn't hear about the color of the slats. What what, what color are tan. they going to be? They'll be tan, just similar to what's existing out there on, on the site um, today. They'll just be refreshed. Brand new ones will be put in installed. I would prefer each slat to be a different color. I know that's <laughs> going to add some expense. I'm waiting for the day when you guys present a colorful decorative slat scheme. Yes. I've seen Great several color. of them on private development and they you can do some cool stuff with slats, you know, think basket weaving. <laughs> they cool have, party. believe it or not, they've they've recently told me that they're they're starting to look at green slats or different colors. So and they're working with neighbors if to to paint murals. It's it's quite some of these processes have led to really cool things happening in neighborhoods. One one site you guys looked at off of Hawthorne um, uh, at the end of last year, it had a, an existing mural on the wall and Tucson Water now is allowing one of the neighbors who reached out saying they wanna paint it, they're going to repaint the mural and it actually should be done here in the next couple of weeks. So maybe by the next next hearing, I'll be able to showcase some, some 
beautiful things that are actually happening on well sites rather than the ones that are some of the challenging ones. And I, I do, uh, Ms. Clements, I do want you to, to be aware that this is something that I have been actively fighting with Tucson Water to ensure. Um, and John Beal at city staff has as well been double checking with them. So again, it's on, on their radar. They know it's a problem and they're trying to address it as, as much as they can. So case by case, I'm hoping we'll, we'll be able to improve these and the process um, sooner or later, but I, I appreciate your guys' patience with this. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. Is there any new outdoor lights? I didn't think I saw any. No, 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 no new lights, no windows. Um, I think that we could have a motion from a member of the board. And Maria, could you put the motion language on the screen? Thank you. I'm happy to make a motion. Thank you. The design review board has reviewed the applicant's project for compliance with special exception use standards on the utilities distribution system and finds the project in compliance with the use specific standards set forth in UDC section 4.9.11.8.8. A.8. Those reversed. Thank you, Rosemary. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second the motion. The motion has been seconded. I'll call for a vote. Um, all those in favor say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Nay. All good nay. Two nays. And I believe the motion passes. Case numbers, uh, item number six, we move on to the next case, which is also going to be in Lexi's court. Case number DRB 2204 SE 2213. Tucson Water Camino Pio Decimo, well improvement and first staff, first a staff up, uh, summary, and then we'll turn it back over to the planning center. Okay, again, Lena Perel, lead planner with Planning and Development Services. Uh, this is a request by Lexi Wallet, project manager for the Planning Center on behalf of the property owner in the city of Tucson for minor technology improvements to the existing Tucson water well, uh, C112, as a sexual exception land use in the R3 zone. The proposed improvements include construction and additional nine feet tall shade structure, uh, to protect the new SCADA upgrades covering approximately 40 square feet, set back less than one foot from the western uh, property boundary, and to be painted to match the existing shade structure. And two, repairing and replacing existing equipment. And three, installing SCADA upgrades. Distribution system uses in the R3 zone are subject to sections 4.9.11.a.1.2.5.8.9 and 11 of the Unified Development Code and require approval through a zoning examiner special exception procedure, section 3.4.3, as well as review by the Design Review Board. This item is scheduled for a zoning examiner public hearing on May 5th, 2022. And again, the DRB's purview in accordance with UDC section 4.9.11.A.8, uh, any building housing such facility shall be in keeping with the character of the zone in which it's located. The design review board shall review all ap applications and make recommendations to the zoning examiner. The DRB shall review architectural style, building elevations, materials on exterior facades, color schemes, new mechanical equipment locations, light of outdoor areas, window locations and types, screening, landscaping, vehicular use areas, and other contributing design features. And I will pass it over to Lexi for her presentation. Great, thank you, Lena. I appreciate uh, your presentation there. 
Again, this is uh, another Tucson water well site. Um, we're looking to do SCADA upgrades. So I'll save the presentation on what the SCADA upgrade is since it's all the same and just jump straight into the, the meat and potatoes of the site here. So to look at um, this site and uh, more specifically, this uh, site is located off of Camino Pio Decimo and uh, north of Edison Street. So this is just south of Broadway Boulevard, I believe. And um, this site is located in an existing alleyway and accessed through the alley. So it's really in the back of house away from everybody. Um, north of the site, you've got some uh, existing multifamily and some some condos, and then as um, some commercial shopping centers, um, as well as some offices, and then again, single family residential to the south. Looking at the site, and I apologize that the imagery on wherever you get it is terrible, so um, bear with me but this site as i mentioned it's located in the back of the alley it's very small very constrained and has got a significant amount of vegetation surrounding it again that vegetation is on the neighboring properties but it is very um enclosed there's a uh one uh well on this site not multiples like we've seen in other cases the well yard is currently enclosed with a five and a half masonry five and a half foot masonry brick wall um, it's got a communication antenna, an existing straight, or an existing state, oh my goodness, cat's got my tongue this morning, shade structure um, that's nine feet in height um, with some vehicular access gates and then the structures on the well site that you guys are familiar with. Again, this site is entirely accessed from the alley and is um, in the, the back of the house. So uh, this request by Tucson Water is to install a new shade structure, very similar to the one um, out on the site to house the, the new electrical equipment. The rack they're planning to install will look and be exactly similar to this um, and will be located on this portion of the site. So there is a brick wall. It, the, the shade structure, as you can see, extends slightly above it. Um, but again, the, the vegetation on the neighboring property should, should block that from view. As part of this process, I just wanted to, to walk you guys through. Of course, we held a neighborhood meeting and this was a well site where we had a few neighbors attend um, this site. And the primary concern was not the well, the operation, but rather um, just during construction and I guess in the, the past operations that have happened on this site, uh, the alley was closed and trash services were, were stopped. So um, that, that concern has been um, passed down to, to Tucson Water and Tucson Water is not proposing any new construction that will um, uh, close down that alley. So other, other than that, the neighbors had no issues with what was being proposed. Um, since this is in the alleyway, landscape plans are not required um, and it's enclosed by the vegetation. So really the special exception request is for um, the shade structure within proximity to the boundary. And again, as we can see, the site is very small and limited. Uh, there's really uh, not enough space to, to, to get the, the structure in there without um, creating some challenging challenges for maintenance of the, the well and the facility back here. So to summarize very briefly, Tucson Water is requesting a special exception to equip the existing well with new technology upgrades. The improvements consist of installing a new nine foot shade structure, which will cover the new equipment. It'll be painted to mimic everything in the, the well site there. They're installing new computer upgrades and then repairing and replacing any equipment that is in disrepair. Items to remain is the general site location and configuration. The masonry block walls will remain in the, as well as the existing access gates. So with that, I will turn it over uh, to you all for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. Will that shade structure be at the same elevation as the exi as the existing one? Uh, Mr. Kaplan, yes, it will be. So it's nine foot in length, but it's not nine feet tall. Correct. I have, uh, I have um, my only comment is that would that would be your substrate for solar panels if you could put some solar panels in there. OK, noted. Hi, Lexi, in, one question. Um, I don't know if I missed this in your presentation, but will the gates be slatted? 
Uh, Rosemary, I, I failed to mention that. Yes, they will be privacy slots will be inserted in the gates just like um, every other project. I'm not sure if that was clearly uh, stated, but that's their intent. Yes, is to put privacy slots. I've directed them to do that. Great, thanks. If there are no questions, this one uh, appears to be straightforward. Um, maybe we can have a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to make a motion if we could have the language up. Thank you. Uh, I make a motion that the design review board has reviewed the applicant's project for compliance with special exception use specific standards for utilities distribution and finds the project in compliance with the use specific standards set forth in the UDC section 4.9.11.A.8. Thank you, Carol. I will second that motion. And without further discussion, I will call for a vote. All those in favor say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed, uh, say nay or raise your hand at this time. The ayes have it, the motion passes. And now we're on to our seventh agenda item, case DRB 2205. Wait for it. It's a Tucson water well improvement project. We're going to skip the staff um, summary and just go straight to Lexi for for the plan review. How does that sound? That sounds great to me. So let me pull it up. Whoops. Wrong one. Which one are we on now? There we go. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. Lexi Wallet again uh, with the Planning Center to East Congress. Um, this is another Tucson water well site um, looking to improve the SCADA uh, system on the, the site. This site, though, I think we saved the best one for last um, in terms of, of just what what what's going on. Um, this site is located at the north or the southwest corner of Camino Seco and Colette Street. It's uh, right on the, the hard hard corner there. And looking at this site a little bit more closely, I just wanted to, to point out a few things. So this site, it's again a, a relatively large Tucson water uh, property, but a couple of things to note here. The eastern property boundary or western property boundary has got an alleyway, a large drainage channel, and then I believe another alleyway on either side of it. So a lot going on on this side that's really out of Tucson Water's control. On the uh, front end of Camino Seco, there's a, a bunch of TEP transformer boxes and a lot of significant vegetation. The beautiful thing about this site is all of this vegetation is currently located in the right of way. So uh, Tucson Waters uh, required landscape borders will be in uh, supplementing this vegetation. So just, just wanted to, to point that out. But again, this well site, very similar to the others, um, is enclosed with a, a six foot chain link fence that has privacy slats in it. This uh, site has a combination of wood and vinyl. Um, Tucson Water will be replacing all of those with uh, the, the tan vinyl slats. And then it's got all the, the familiar technology that we, we see um, on all the other sites as well. Of this process, Tucson Water is looking to install a new shade structure very similar to the, the others you've seen on site, and it'll be located along the southern property boundary or uh, the southern boundary of the well yard. In addition to um, 
the shape structure, Tucson Water is planning a 10 foot landscape border along 26, uh, or excuse me, along Colette Street, as well as Camino Seco. So as I mentioned, all of this vegetation along the right of way will be um, uh, preserved and then supplemented with an additional 10 foot buffer. We are in the, the process of seeing if there's any um, flexibility and, and approval from TDOT to supplement some of the landscaping in here because some of it is in disrepair. I think we're gonna clean it up to make it look a little bit nicer and then see if there's any ability to supplement with some uh, low ground covers. But as, as for the, the requirements here, we are planning a 10 foot landscape buffer in accordance to the city of Tucson's um, code. And I submitted the landscape plans for your, your guys' review that have been prepared. Um, all of the space in between the well yard itself and the landscape border will be covered with decorative rock, which will help with some of that dust abatement as well as beautify the site there. Again, just to reiterate, this is Tucson Water requesting a special exception to equip the existing well with new technology upgrades. We're proposing to install a new shade structure on the southern boundary, as well as the SCADA upgrades um, and a 10 foot landscape border along the northern and west eastern, sorry, property boundaries there. Uh, items to remain the same as the general site configuration and well location. The chain link fence will stay. Again, privacy slats will be refreshed. Um, and then existing healthy vegetation and the access gates will all remain. So with that, I will turn it over to you all for any questions you may have. Thank you. Carol? <laughs> yes. Uh, Lexi, might you have the landscape plans to uh, put up on your screen? I sure do. Let me pull them up real quick. Thank you very much. I, and I also would like to say I appreciate Tucson Water making the effort to improve the landscape, existing landscape uh, plantings, border plantings. Thank you. OK, yes. here it comes. Can you guys see that? Oh, whoops, I haven't shared it. Sorry, you can't see anything. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh. So, and as you can tell too, Carol, what we've done is is added some additional vegetation beyond that landscape border. So while it's not required, um, we've asked the plant, the planning center being we have asked Tucson Water since they have some space and there is no limitations with utilities um, to to add some additional vegetation. And I see your note: landscape recess six inches throughout for water harvesting. Oh. Does the gray shaded area indicate that recessed air uh, channel? <laughs> I, I believe that's what they're they're showing here is I think it's serving twofold is that it's showing the the recessed area and then also the required width of that that boundary I think. Okay so perhaps uh, trying to be more polite on this one than I was the last one, uh, a recommendation could be made that the uh, details for the water harvesting basins be uh, further illustrated or something like that. How does that work for you guys? Again, I have the same problem. The guy, they're not going to the guys won't be, they, I, they won't know what this means out in the field. They're not going to understand this. I think I feel fine with making a recommendation to um, increase the level of detail of the water harvesting suggested. You know what might help in, in terms of communication is to ask them to to bring forward the detail onto the site plan and it looks like there may not be space in the layout but if you could have see detail number one and then that would be right there then there's no possibility that it could be missed i like that nathan <sighs> Oh, 
Chris, what are you thinking, please? What are your thoughts, sir? I'm still stuck on that this board is looking at finishes, overall zoning requirements and quantities and locations of plant material. If there's not a, a relief being requested for landscaping, then landscaping is uh, is shown on a plan or shown even on a site plan as being location, schematic location of where it is meeting or exceeding city of Tucson development codes is up to Ann Warner and development services, in my opinion. If they're mentioning or and have it on their application that they're going to provide water harvesting for city of Tucson standards. That's all I need to hear on this board. Yeah, if, you have, but if, you have, if you have concerns about the end result and the mark makeup of, of how this stuff's installed, that's really an inspection with city development services condition, not necessarily whether we're going to allow them to do these improvements on this site to make make improvements to screening and fencing and other requirements. That's my opinion. Does it look like the water harvesting doesn't hit some of the trees on the inside? Like it, it's only in that one path and it hits a lot of the trees, but there's three that aren't being addressed with water harvesting. Am I reading that properly? I believe the shaded area is the landscape board required landscape border. Or is that not right, Lexi? I, I think you're you're correct. And I, I mean, I think it is serving on this. It's maybe a little confusing. I, I think it is serving, but per the requirements, we will have to put landscape water harvesting basins wherever they are required. So if it is, if the code requires it around every single tree, while it may not be shown, again, that's this plan, the, the intent is to show what is exactly required. And then this is just to illustrate that we are doing above and beyond what is exactly required. But I, it's, my, it's my understanding that when trees are installed, they'll have to have some some sort of um, water harvesting associated with it to to meet the the calculations, and that that seems to be uh, where it usually happens is in tree basins. There. So we all know that it it is required as per code, but we also know that it doesn't get built in the field. So who is it? The inspector that perhaps. I should go down and talk to. Would that be appropriate and say, hey, this isn't happening out in the field. What can I do to help this situation? Drives me crazy and it's a short drive. Oh. Uh, Ms. Clements, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the DRB, I can, um, you know, have a conversation with the inspection team and uh and bring uh to them your concerns and um and see what they let me know and i can uh give you an update at the next drb meeting and uh miss clements um if you want to email me separately uh we can arrange for that also with the inspectors thank you maria carol um when you say Water harvesting. Um, so, for example, here there's going to be some a depression, but where is the water coming from? Uh, Where's the sheet flow of the water coming from? Is it just so maybe there's a maybe there's a mismatch of what the expectation is. If it's just a depression, it will fill up with water if rain falls into it. Correct. But it's not That's like the rest of the landform is directing water into it. Is, and is that your expectation? And is that the um, expectation of the, uh, is that the project intent to grade the site to fall into the planting area? Or is it just like planting in a depression? It, uh, it, I think to expect them to regrade the land to create sheet flow into this basin is asking way too much. I would be happy with this to be depressed basin in which water falls into and is uh, detained. So it's just a rainfall. You're just basin. collecting. You're just collecting just exactly what falls rain. straight down from Correct. the sky. Got but it. what concerns me about this, it's six inches deep, which is actually a little too deep. And there's no um, details showing the slope of the side slopes. 
How steep are they? Will they hold? Are they laid back? Are they one to three or they're going to be one to five or are they one to one side slopes? Are they going to collapse? There's no detail showing a nicely yeah. laid back repose side slope with a nice flat bottom and, you know. That's the DDRB, the Detail Design Review Board. Right, the... I know. <laughs> hey, hey, Carol, I have, uh, this is Chris, I have some input on that. Everything you just discussed is covered in the Rainwater Harvesting Plan, which is a code required plan to be submitted for development of a commercial site. The details Carol's talking about are part of that plan. The slope, the grade, where water flows, it's, is all part of that plan to be described and shown on the water, Rainwater Harvesting Plan. All of that information is code required and will be required to be presented and approved prior to this site being developed. So the discussion you're having on details and where the water's coming from is part of the development plan process. And Correct. Is, is that note that process, does it is it noted on this plan? For example, it could say this plan will <clears throat> provide a detailed water harvesting plan to comply with. X, Y, and Z. It they can't build the project until they provide that plan. They, it's in the UDC. That it's a, it's a requirement of the city of Tucson to provide that plan before this plan, any of this work happens. They need a construction <coughs> permit. Can't get a construction permit until you provide that plan, and it's approved by Development Services. So we're but the we're we're the asking for information that that needs to be required is required under a different set of plans. Like it's not required for us. We. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I, we're I, asking for us to become development services at this point, and we're not. Yeah, I think we're finally getting to the root of the issue, and in that is, the people out in the field do not install the water harvesting activities, the 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 uh, water harvesting basins as per code that therein lies the gap so i think it's correct that perhaps the problem lies in the uh inspection or the uh the actual work done out in the field how do we get that done and i think i will email maria and ask her how uh, i could possibly talk to the inspectors about this issue or maybe um, see where that leads us. How about that? And kind of as a sidebar, Carol, on that comment, Ann and Ann Warner at the City of Tucson, yeah. they currently have a task force running right now to review and revise the rainwater harvesting criteria and plan and approval process because they are finding in practice the reduction of water by 50% within three years is not being tracked or enforced and right. other issues with right. that plan. So there is actual effort to review and revise the implementation of that plan. And um, here's another one for you, Maria, we should probably have some interaction with the review and the revisions of the native plant, native plant preservation plan that are actually active at this time too. So Carol, I think those are your avenues to get the information you're looking for and see if we can influence any revisions to those plan types. Okay. Good, okay, good, the, and, thank you, good, and, yeah, good and healthy discussion there. Any other comments from the design review board? Grace, what do you think? Um, yeah, so I'm I'm thinking the landscape conversation best left to the people who know more about that. Um, but in terms of the um, architectural, uh, we're just adding that shade structure. I don't have any particular concerns about that. Not much to work with here, huh, Grace, architecturally? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is Are we ready for a motion? I think we are. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, uh, Maria, maybe you better put the motion back on the screen <laughs> so someone can read it. A 
I'm happy to go if you guys want me to. Sounds good. Okay, the design review board has reviewed the applicant's project for compliance with special exception use specific standards for utilities distribution system and finds, finds the project in compliance with the use specific standard set forth in UDC section 4.9.11.a.8. Thank you. Thank you. It's been seconded. I'll call for a vote. All members in favor, vote. With, uh, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay. I got one nay. The motion passes. Thank you, Design Review Board. Thank you, staff, and thank you, the Planning Center. Yeah. Number eight, call to the audience. I know there's a lot of audience members out there. They've been been very patient. So is there would anyone like to say something as an audience member? What? There's no audience? All right. Staff announcements. Number nine. Any uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, members of the DRB, you know, um, I, we welcomed earlier um, Ms. Grace Shaw to the DRB. Grace, you want to tell the DRB a little bit about yourself? Uh, some may not know you. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so I do think I, I've presented a couple of times, so I, I think maybe um, a little bit familiar with me, but um, I am an architect. I live in Barrio Viejo. Um, I'm also serving on the Barrio Historic, uh, Historico Historic Zone Advisory Board. Uh, it's kind of a mouthful. Um, but yeah, I'm just I'm excited to be here and to and to get involved. So thanks for having me. Welcome, Grace. Yes, welcome. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> and in All terms right. of announcements, Mr. Chair, you know uh, we have an upcoming uh, rezoning case. Uh, it's a conversion from a home to an office use, and it has to go through DRB because it's going to be zone 01. Um, so that's part of the purview for the DRB and um, and I think that's all the cases I have so far in line, but that can change any second. Okay. Remember, we cannot we cannot gather more more than three of us cannot gather at any one event without uh, canceling that event. All right, we are if are there any uh, comments have... or questions? Yeah, uh, Maria, what happened to the review of the Sunshine Mile thing that was good? Did I miss it? No, I had it in the agenda um, for last meeting two weeks ago, but I was not going to have enough DRB members attending. So I, okay. you know, okay. I canceled that meeting. It's important for all of you to be present if possible, or at least most of you. Uh, but yeah, uh, we don't have a case lined up yet um, for DRB review, uh, but maybe at the next scheduled DRB meeting next uh, in two weeks, we can actually do a presentation, an overview of the Sunshine Mile district. Um, there's one case coming in um, in the near future, though, that would be the Zemans um, restaurant on Broadway near Country Club. They are expanding. So that will require review uh, by the DRB. So we need to get on to this, um, you know, training overview of the Sunshine Mile District. Sounds good, thank you. Thanks. All right, um, we are officially adjourned. Thanks everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Bye everyone. Thanks, bye. Bye. bye.